Welcome to the One Big Thing Podcast, where inspiration meets transformation. I'm Steve Campbell, your host, and I invite you to embark on this exhilarating journey with me. Are you searching for that extra spark, that push to propel you in the right direction? Look no further. The One Big Thing is all about bringing you incredible guests from diverse backgrounds. So picture this, professional athletes, visionary business leaders, fellow podcasters, and even awe-inspiring stay-at-home moms who are all conquering life's challenges. Get ready to seize your moment of greatness. Don't miss out. Subscribe and follow the One Big Thing podcast today. Welcome back to the One Big Thing Podcast with your host, Steve Campbell. Folks, this is episode number two. Before we even jump into today and I introduce one of my good friends and amazing guest, I just want to say thank you. Uh, The feedback that we received from episode one where my wife was willing to step outside of her comfort zone, where we talked about our real life behind the scenes, getting to know me as a host through the lens of my wife, talking about parenting and marriage, the feedback that we got from people that I didn't even know were listening to the show that shared how much that impacted them as young parents being married to feel like somebody else was in their their shoes and understood what they were going through. Amazing. It keeps me going. And that's the whole point of this show. You can listen to a lot of uh, encouraging, inspirational podcasts that get you revved up, but you can walk away and feel like, man, I don't even know how to implement anything of what I just learned. And it can be frustrating. The whole point of the one big thing is I want to bring on real people that have real stories, that have gone through real things that can share practical insights culminating in the one big thing that you as a listener can take away from every episode and implement if you see fit, or if it doesn't fit, that's okay too. And I'm very particular about who I want to come on this show, people that have inspired me, people that have encouraged me, and today you guys are in for a treat. I want to introduce you to one of my good friends, Rachel Jenks, and give her, let's welcome her to the One Big Thing podcast studio. Rachel, I'm glad to have you here today. Do you want to give us a little insight uh, as to kind of who you are and what you do? Sure. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me, Steve. It is such a pleasure to always have any conversation with you, but especially this one that I am excited to share today. And thank you very much, listener, for tuning in to the One Big Thing podcast. So I am Rachel Jenks. I am the brand boss. I am chief brand boss of the Brand Boss Studio, and I am passionate about helping others, particularly in business, own your difference and rock it like a boss. And we're going to talk about more of that today. And I think kind of what I want to give you a little glimpse into is that it's it's more than a slogan to me. It's more than marketing. It's really my life story that I'm excited to share with you today. And as you're listening, whether you're in business or not, I hope that there are still nuggets that you find in my story that you can carry with you into your own. Yeah. And as I'd mentioned to you in episode one, you're going to hear from people from all walks of life. Some you may, when you start listening, feel like you have nothing in common with, but stick with us as Rachel kind of shares her story, how we met and what she's doing, because she's incredible and the takeaways are going to be real. Thank you. So Rachel, we know you as the brand boss to all of our listeners today, but there's always a backstory to everything that we do as people. Uh, You didn't just happen to become the brand boss. So why don't you share a little bit of your story, your journey to give our listeners insight as to who you are. I love that question. Thank you. Yes. So I did not start off as the brand boss. I started off as the ballerina (laughs) and that's who I thought I was going to be. That's what I thought I wanted to do with my life. And just in an incredible, honestly, gift um, at 17, I went to a summer intensive thinking that this was kind of my last hurrah before I had to go to college and get a real job. And was invited to join a professional company and one of my childhood dreams came true. Yeah, it was absolutely incredible. And uh, and so my first career was actually professional ballet, which was amazing until it wasn't. You know, I was dancing 10 hours a day, six days a week. And as you can imagine, there's only how long, you know, a certain amount of time that your body can really withstand that. Um, So started to have some injuries and things like that and had to stop and... That was very devastating. I'm not going to lie. That was a very, very difficult season in my life. And I just want to say to you who are listening that if you have been through a season where you found your identity in something Mm -hmm. and then it was gone, I just want to encourage you that your identity is bigger than what you do. And for me, that's been 
that's been a big part of my journey, you know, because when I was doing ballet, I actually hid other parts of who I was. Hmm. I didn't want them to know anything about me other than that I was a ballerina. And which I kind of laugh now because there's <laughs> way, way, way more to me than that. But that's what I was finding my identity in, in that moment. And I think that's what I was finding sameness in, if I'm honest. Yeah. I was kind of not different in that. Like, okay, we're all here. We're all ballet dancers. We're all, you know, I mean, some specialize more in jazz and other things, but we're all dancers. That's what I found my identity in. Yeah. And so when it was gone, I really did go through this questioning process of who am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? And I think whether it is professional sports, whether it is a dream that we have had, you know, I just think it can be so many things in our lives that we get wrapped up in our identity being what we do. And I just want to encourage you, that's not the fullness of who you are. And so kind of to go on with my career journey from there. So, you know, here I've just moved from upstate New York to Jacksonville, Florida, and not just moved. I had been there for a hot minute, but I didn't have a life outside of the studio. Cause as you can imagine, when you dance 10 hours a day, six days a week, like there is not time for anything else. Like there's not time for friends. There's not time for hobby. There's not time for anything else. And so not only did I find myself in a place where I was learning who I was, like everything around me has shifted. And, you know, obviously one of those being that I had to find a job. So a lady who knew of the company reached out to the company and she was an entrepreneur, is still to this day an entrepreneur, and she scheduled itinerant authors. She ran a book packing company and she had an 18 month old and she needed help with all the things. And so I dove in with her and went from dancing 10 hours a day, six days a week to now I was answering the phone and packing books and changing diapers and whatever needed to be done at the moment. Natural transition. Kind of a wild ride. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Makes sense. A little bit. <laughs> so in the midst of navigating, who am I now? Right? Like nothing, nothing major going on personal growth rise. I'm like what? So, uh, so I jumped in with her and her daughter and uh, just kind of found, you know, did whatever my hands found to do that she needed help with. And very quickly, one of those authors that she scheduled took off like wildfire. And um, for any of you who are faith-based and remember the late 90s, that was Tommy Tenney who wrote a book called The God Chasers. And overnight, it seems, it went from like, hey, there's this guy. He's coming to your town. Would you like to have him speak at your church? To, I'm sorry, he's booked solid for the next year, but we can maybe get you on the wait list for the next two years. Mm. I mean, it was just crazy. That happened probably within about six months. And I went on that ride because then he needed somebody to go on the road and do public relations and run the book table. And so that became me. And then the lady that I was working for and I formed a partnership and took on more clients and they needed somebody to go on the road and do PR. And so, you know, overnight, again, my life just like flipped from, okay, I am a professional dancer to, I don't know what to call myself, but this is what I'm doing. And for several years, I just lived with my bag packed at all times because the phone can ring in a second like, hey, your flight leaves in an hour. You're going to this conference. And so I think really if we're looking at identity, which is kind of the theme that I want to highlight today, that you know, my identity went from like, hey, my identity is being a ballet dancer to my identity is okay, now I'm, you know, the on the road PR person doing all of this stuff. And I didn't really know what entrepreneurship was back then. Like nobody was even using that word. Right. Um, but that's, you know, but I was launched head first into it. And so I kind of found a lot of my identity in that, to be honest with you. And I did that for a number of years. And, um, you know, travel sounds exciting and it sounds fun, but it can also be really lonely. And you get really tired of eating out and you get really tired of hotel rooms and all that kind of stuff. But I just kind of kept plugging away. But I knew there was more to me than that. Yeah. And so then in 2005, so now I am 25 years old at this point in my story. And I had done this. And all of a sudden, I just felt that it was time to move back to Rochester, New York, which is where I grew up. And honestly, was the last place I wanted to go, like trade the beach for the winter? I don't think so. Sounds great. <laughs> you know? Let's do it. And right? Like, no, that's that. No, thank you. 
but I knew that's what I needed to do. And so I quit my job and I gave away pretty much everything that I owned, packed everything else that would fit in my little Honda Civic and drove north. And I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I knew that's where I needed to be. And so I moved back to Rochester. And before I moved back to Rochester, this gentleman kept coming to mind who is best friends with my parents to this day. He is an, a very successful businessman. His name is Rex. And I didn't know why he kept coming to mind. I was like, that is so weird. Like, why do I keep thinking about him? You know, and honestly, for me, like when that would happen, I just like pray for him or whatever. But I had never really had a conversation with him other than knowing his name in the context of my parents. So when I moved back and I was trying to figure out like, okay, what am I going to do with my life? I was like, you know, I just think I need to meet with him. And so I did. And he asked me some phenomenal questions that really made me think, you know, he was like, Rachel, if the sky was the limit and you could do anything, Hmm. if, you know, money, time, all of that were no object, what would you do? And I really had to think because for a girl who grew up wanting two things to be a ballet dancer and to be a mom, like I was like, uh, I don't know. Like there's, <laughs> there's nobody in my life right now and I'm not doing ballet. Like, I don't know. I've just kind of been doing what needs to be done. Yep. And I think there's seasons in life for that, right? There's seasons in life where we just kind of do yep. what needs to be done. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah. So I was like, I, I, don't know. I don't know what I want to do with my life. This is kind of an interesting question. And so I did a lot of soul searching and I ended up starting a consulting business. And what's really cool to me now, Steve, is I look back and I see that it was all branding. I just didn't have that terminology. And a lot of it had to do with identity. Who are you as a company? Is what you're doing in alignment with who you say you are and all that stuff. And there were, there were some more things that I did, but that was essentially it was my business was consulting. And so this gentleman that was mentoring me became one of my main clients. And then I had a good friend who was also my age, who was also an entrepreneur. And he did everything from IT to multimedia. And some of my favorite memories, you know, we went for coffee and he was like, hey, I could use your help. And I was like, hey, I could use your help. And so we kind of formed a loose like business partnership. We were also part of the same friend group. So one of my favorite memories with him, just to give you an idea of like the scope of stuff I was doing is he was filming a book trailer for a client. And I will never forget lying in the middle of a field in Watertown, New York at, you know, 6 a.m. on a Saturday. And there were horses and helicopters and people running at each other in kilts. And it was incredible. And uh, so, yeah. So again, kind of doing a lot of different things. And every time that I worked with him, I would kind of watch over his shoulder because he had these tools like Photoshop and, you know, Adobe Premiere and all of these things that I was like, wow, like I really, I really love what you're doing, but I didn't know how to do any of that. So, and there's, there's a backstory to that that maybe I'll share. But um, anyway, so I just, I loved working with him. I loved working for Rex. I loved consulting for these various businesses And again, this whole time I had gifts and skills inside of me that I didn't know that I had, Hmm. first of all, because I hadn't had the opportunity to use them and because I had somebody tell me that I didn't. There you go. So I do feel like I'm supposed to share this part of my story, so I will. (laughs) So back growing up, like I was always creative. I have been creative through and through. Like my mom says I was dancing as soon as I was born, like just everything about me. And it's not limited to one genre, right? It's music, it's dance, it's poetry, it's writing, it's all of these things. It's theater. Like all of these things have been part of who I am. And that included art. And in seventh grade, I had my very first real art class. I went to a small private school and uh, and up until then, like art had been so much fun to me and we made sculptures and collages and did these things. And I like got so excited for art class. And then this day we had this teacher come in who was a real art teacher. And she took her shoe and sock off and put her foot on the table, which grossed us all out and told us to draw it. And we were like, OK, nobody had ever shown us how. 
And I remember for that entire class trying so hard, like I knew up here what needed to be on my paper, but I couldn't make what was on here come out on the paper. Mm. And it was so frustrating to me. And I remember just the frustration of that. And when she came around to each of us at the end, she got to me and she said, Rachel, you are a girl with many talents, but art is not one of them and you should probably never pursue it. That was one statement from one teacher I had only just met in one class. And somehow that one statement, because it spoke to my identity, Mm. right? Suddenly put the kibosh on art for me. And I used to, at the time I was babysitting every week and I would take a sketchbook with me and I would sketch when the kids went to bed. And I remember bringing the sketchbook with me that week, pulling it out and saying, what am I doing? I have no artistic talent. And I threw the sketchbook in the trash and I didn't pull it out again. I didn't take a single art class in high school. I didn't do anything with art. I mean, I was very crafty and I was doing stuff like that all the time, but I didn't do anything with art because what happened in that moment is somebody told me who I was and I believed them. Somebody told me a lie about who I was and I believed them and I allowed that lie to shape my identity for many, many years. So fast forward to now I am 25 years old and let me like back up a little bit and say that when I was at the ballet company, one of the things that I did for fun is I would help design flyers and stuff like that for them just for fun. And when I worked for this lady who was an entrepreneur, I did all of our branding when we formed a partnership and took on more clients. And I stayed up until three in the morning making her daughter's birthday party invitations and all that stuff. And I just did it because I loved it. But in my mind, I had no artistic talent. Hmm. So fast forward to 25 years old and I'm working with this guy who does all this multimedia and I'm fascinated and I'm watching over his shoulder, trying to pick up everything that I can. Still believing the lie, that's for other people. I have no artistic talent myself, which is going to play a very important role in my story here in a moment. So again, I was doing, you know, all of these things and Rex, the main gentleman who was my mentor and that I was consulting for had lots of things under his umbrella. He was a serial entrepreneur with many different businesses and nonprofit involvements and everything. And one of them particularly caught my attention. And that is that he was the president of the U.S. board of an organization based in Cambodia. It was an international organization, far bigger than Cambodia, but that's where their headquarters were. And they rehabilitated women who'd been trafficked and children who'd been trafficked and took them from point of rescue through counseling, education, vocational training, healthcare. And then the women had the opportunity to be employed in one of three different business ventures that they had and fully reintegrated into society. It was the most holistic program out there at the time. And back then, people didn't even know human trafficking was a thing. It wasn't talked about, even though it was the third largest form of organized crime worldwide. Now it's sadly probably much higher than that. Yep. And so the more that I learned about this issue, the more that I learned about what they were doing, the more that I learned about the women having the chance to get their lives back, like the more passionate I became about what they were doing. And then the board approached me to be the director of public awareness. Hey, now. And so now, huh? Yeah. Hey, now. That's great. It was, it was wild. So now all of a sudden at the, you know, wet behind my ears age of 25, which I really was at that point, (laughs) uh, I found myself networking at private receptions at the state department and going to the UN and going to all of these high level things and networking with like the head of, you know, the Salvation Army and like these various crazy places going, how did I get here? Does anybody know that I'm here right now? Like what? This is wild. And so, and getting to build relationships for them at a very high level. So I did that and I threw myself into it and I was on, you know, Skype was the thing back then. So I was on Skype calls at 11 at night and I was traveling here and there and doing all of this. And I had three different friends take me to lunch and say, you know, Rach, you know, it's not your job to single-handedly end human trafficking, right? Hmm. And I was like, what? It's not? 
(laughs) And looking back, what I realized is, yes, I was passionate about that issue, but also I had found my identity in that again. Yep. So I went from finding my identity in being a ballerina to finding my identity in being the helper to finding my identity in being, you know, this is what I do for my job to finding my identity in a cause. And I want to stop for a minute and say those are all incredible, beautiful, important things. And I am grateful for every single one of those I got to be involved in. At the same time, who I am is so far beyond what I do. And none of those things were my identity that I found my identity in. And I think that so often it's an easy thing to fall into. I think especially I want to talk for anybody Um, for a minute, for anybody who finds themselves drawn to that nonprofit impact, you know, kind of space, like that's a beautiful space. I just want to encourage you that who you are goes even farther than that. And the greatest impact that you can bring to any cause you're passionate about is who you are and is the fullness of who you are. But we'll get into that in a minute. If we ended episode two right here, it's worth a listen. What I love about this show is where it goes. I allow all my guests to have the freedom to talk about what's important to them. And when you listen, you'll hear something different. We've been friends for a decade. And some of what you just shared, I had no idea. I've just loved you as a person. What what I can identify with is my identity growing up was in sports. You know, for many of us, when we're in middle school and high school, very few of us have an identity attached to an occupation because we've never experienced the world. It's in things that we do. It's in hobbies. It's in activities. It's in sports. For me, I was always a strong, big kid. And I um, was able to earn a division one scholarship to play lacrosse. Well, who knew in that my last high school football game, I'd blow out my knee and tear my ACL. And that moment of being there on the field surrounded, and then years later, my college career never took off. I was never from that moment the same athlete that I was prior to injuring my knee. I never saw the field in college. You will actually hear a few episodes from now from my old coach who was willing to come on this show and share the intimate, heart-wrenching conversations I had in his office with him as a person that I was the last person on the depth chart in terms of talent. And he used to ask me, why don't you transfer to a school? You have the heart of a champion, but your body can't do it go somewhere else and play. And you're going to hear from him because that's real life and the things he's accomplished. But I can identify with you from your stories of being a ballerina that so many of us growing up wrap our identity in what we do for a living. And even in your story, it goes from, we have to fill that void in our life. So there's a delicate balance between not trying to formulate our identity and being single, being married, being a parent, doing our job, but it's so hard as human beings not to do. And I think what I love about your story is, is the realness and rawness of how many people you're going to help from what you just shared that, that may be struggling right now with love, with acceptance of themselves, because they are truly wrapping their identity in what they produce every single day. And it's a delicate balance because a healthy mindset gets, I have the privilege to do these things. This is the outlet that God's given me to change the world and to help people. But if we're not careful, we can allow the other side to really affect our mindset. And I, there was something that I want to go back to because you said it, and I didn't even know you were going to talk about this. A lot of what we are dealing with as adults, whether you're in your late twenties, your thirties, your forties, however old you are listening to the show, there has been things spoken over all of our lives as kids that if you're not aware of why you react, how you do to your spouse, or your kids, why you've quit every single job you've ever had, why you never feel good enough as a person probably stems from something that actually happened to you as a kid. And it it literally could have been in a passing moment. And that story is so real and relevant because you were trying and what an adult spoke over you, unfortunately shaped the way you saw yourself in every facet of your life moving forward. And I think kind of as Steph and I talked about in our first episode, the exterior of our lives can look so put together. What we put on social media, our joy, our happiness, we love our job, but inwardly there could be a brokenness 
that if you don't recognize that and you don't honestly think back to like, what, why do I think these things when these things happen? A lot of us struggle with the idea of why did that thought come to my mind? Why did I doubt myself so much? And if we'll be honest with our thoughts and our feelings, your revelation that's, that affected you at 25 years old stemmed from something that happened years before. I think there's going to be a lot of listeners in this moment nodding in their car, or watching us on YouTube that are going to go, yeah, me too. Something that my parents spoke over me as a kid or a teacher, someone in authority is usually where it comes from. It's not, it could have been from a friend, but typically a lot of our, how we see ourselves is formed from somebody that had authority over our life, a teacher, a parent, who have you that said, you know, you're not meant to do this. So I, I didn't know Rach that you were going to go into all of that, but you just helped a lot of people. And, and I, I want to just continue this conversation for where you're going. Cause I'm fascinated. I am, I've been friends with you for a decade and I'm learning so much as you talk right now that is going to inspire a lot of people. Why don't we, why don't we just continue with where you were kind of what, what have you been learning in this process and what else do you want to share that can maybe fill in the blanks of where you are today? Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I didn't think I was going to share that either. It's not a story that I share with a lot of people, but it was just very strongly on my heart today. And if there is something that has been spoken over you, here's the reality. You get to choose whether or not you agree. Yep. And I'm about to tell you the part of my story that broke that glass ceiling for me. So Um, so here I was, you know, I was the director of public awareness for this organization doing this awesome cause, you know, doing my part to raise awareness and help fight human trafficking. And then in 2007, I had been on the road for about a month and a half, this particular trip. I actually just got back from Cambodia, walked off the plane, literally walked off the plane and emceed a benefit concert we were doing for this organization And the very next morning, Rex and his business partner, Chuck, brought me in their office with tears in their eyes and said, we are so sorry, Rachel. We love the work that you're doing. But to put things in historical perspective, this was was 2007, 2008, right? Economic Mm -hmm. crash. And they said, you know, while you've been on the road, we've been losing contracts. We've had to let engineers go. And as much as we love the work you're doing, we just don't have the funds to put behind it anymore. We have to let you go. Mm -hmm. And while I was consulting for them, really all my work at that point was Hagar. I'd pretty much let go of all my other clients and everything. So now here I am, 27 years old. Again, I had found my identity in what I did. Who am I? And what did I want to be when I grew up? So I did a lot of soul searching in the month that followed. And I will say to Rex and Chuck's credit, every time I tell this story, I just want to honor them because they were incredible. Like they took me to lunch. They prayed for me. They called me every week. How are you doing? How can we help? And I think a lot of it, I just had to navigate internally myself and see who I wanted to be when I grew up. And I kind of had this aha moment that I only wanted something in the creative field. That's who I am through and through. And, uh, And so I started to go after that. But here's the reality. In 2007, nobody would talk to you if you didn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. And so here I have years of national and international public relations experience at a very high level. I had just been networking at the UN and nobody would talk to me because I didn't have a degree. Pretty crazy, but that was how it was. And so, um, so even though I had all this experience, I had a very hard time finding a job. And I needed to eat. (laughs) So I joined a temp agency and I gave them very specific instructions. I only want something in the creative field. Don't give me anything that's not creative. And so they gave me this lead for a temp receptionist at a production company. And I got very upset. And I said, you didn't listen to me. I'm not a receptionist. I don't know what this is. They're like, well, we thought it could get your foot in the door. I was like, all right, fine. I got to (laughs) eat. So I go to the interview. And I look the president and vice president of the production company in the eyes and say, I am not a receptionist. I have no desire to be a receptionist. I'm here to join your creative team. And they didn't really know what to do with me. (laughs) And they said, well, 
our receptionist is on vacation for the next two weeks. Can you start there? It's like, all right, fine. So I go from saving the world to sorting the mail. And Steve, there was no purpose in it for me. And you and I are very similar in that. Like if there's no purpose in what we're doing. I ain't like, doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I am out. I give you my two weeks. Like that's it. So on the third day, because God likes third days, they gave me the job of organizing the bios on the server. And what I actually mean is like, you know how you pull up like your file explorer or whatever you have, mm -hmm. depending if you're Mac or PC, and you like put things in alphabetical order? Yep. That's what they gave me for the entire day. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with my life? <laughs> like, what? And so I'm like, well, I might as well read these bios because I just did that whole project in two seconds, you know? And so I start reading them. And that's when I saw they had won national awards. They had done special effects for Hollywood. They produced some of the largest sales and marketing and association events in the entire world. And that's when I realized I could be walking away from a golden opportunity. So I told them I would stay. And they gave me a PowerPoint to spruce up. Now, at this point, I was very familiar with PowerPoint. I had used it extensively in my career but I had never had access to Photoshop. So just like every temp receptionist does, right? I stayed playing in Photoshop until nine o'clock at night because it was the first I ever had access to the software. And so I spruced up the PowerPoint, sent it off, having no clue that it was a major sales presentation that the president and vice president of the company were giving to a very large client the next day with no backup plan. So I was really glad I didn't know when I was playing in Photoshop, you know, no pressure. So that presentation went well. They got the client. They came and thanked me. And the next thing I knew, the media director was in my office saying, hey, you really have an eye for this, don't you? I was like, yeah, I do. She was like, all right, you want another project? I said, yes, ma'am. And so for the next several years, she would come in my office with some harebrained project, usually something I had never done before. And she would say, you got this? I'd say, yep. I got this and she would leave and I got on lynda.com back then because that's what we had and Linda. Adobe TV, you know it. <laughs> and I taught myself everything I could get my hands on, everything from video editing, post-production, illustration, 3D motion graphics, graphic design, audio editing, e-learning, like you name it. If the production company did it, I learned it. <laughs> and in the middle of this, God tapped on my shoulder and he said, hey, we going to go get that design degree now? And I was like, heck no. They're going to laugh me out of there. Like you already know I have no artistic talent. What, what are you talking about? Did you just hear what I was doing for a job? Right. But did you hear what I believed about myself? Yep. Because one teacher in seventh grade told me I had no artistic talent. Which is why I had to go back to school. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. And so finally, I find myself one day, you know, when your hands kind of do things on your own and you're like, I don't even know how that just happened. Mm -hmm. And I signed up and then the recruiter called me and I was like, listen, I know I filled out that application, but I'm telling you, I have no artistic talent. And he was like, okay, but I'm hearing what you do for a living. And I don't like something doesn't add up here. And I was like, eh. and so got my acceptance letter in the mail that next week. And in God's sense of humor, the very first class was perspective drawing. <laughs> and it was like, oh, nobody ever told me how. Like, I can draw. Nobody ever told me how. And still, I don't consider myself a fine artist. Like, please, please don't ask me to draw. <laughs> I still get a little bit nervous. But anyway, so I went back to school online for my design degree while working 60 to 80 hours a week at a production company at this production company. And in that broke off the glass ceiling of, I have no artistic talent. I had the talent. I didn't have access to the tools <laughs> and I didn't have the training necessary to step into it. And so I did that. <clears throat> and then my master plan from there was that, okay, now I am a designer. Are you hearing a theme here? Yep. Right? Like, Oh, this is what my identity is now, like my identity now is I'm a designer. 
I'm going to go be a designer at an ad agency in New York because my parents had both been in the advertising world in New York City um, before they became full-time pastors. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm so much like so grateful that God knows better than we do what we want for our lives right. because I would have been miserable there, but I had no idea. So this was my master plan. I was going to finish my degree. I was going to go to New York City. I was going to be a designer. But there was a plot twist. And the plot twist was that I fell in love with a news anchor in Binghamton, New York, which, as you well know, Steve, is not New York City by any stretch of the imagination. It's, de it's definitely not, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Small town. I love Binghamton. I have a very special place in my heart for Binghamton now. It's actually where you and I met, Steve. Yep. And had the incredible opportunity to be part of being really the renaissance of the entrepreneurial community there, which was absolutely incredible. But um, but at the time, it was not where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I ended up moving to be closer to him. And that relationship went sideways. But in the process of dating him, I learned organically what makes a good news story. What will the news cover? What will they not cover? When's the best time to hold a press conference? All these things. I met the local news media just through dating him. I didn't know I was learning these things. Then I was a designer at an ad agency there. And I lovingly refer to that season of my life as the mafia because that may or may not have been who I worked for. Like that was very much the environment. Highly toxic, intimidation, manipulation, throwing people under the bus. Like it was just awful. And the work that we put out was crappy. Like I hated everything about it. But in the process, I learned the world of advertising and I met all of the local media and I was part of all of the press conferences and all that kind of stuff. And so I just want to encourage you, if you are in a season in your life that you feel like makes no sense, there is nothing in your life that happens that there's not golden. Hmm. Like there is something we can carry with us from every season into the next. There is always gold. There is always treasure if we choose to see it, if we choose to look for it. And sometimes we don't see it at the time. Sometimes we see it looking back, right? I didn't see treasure at the time. I saw it looking back in terms of what it set me up for. And there's always growth that's happening in us, that's happening around us. There's always things that we're learning about ourselves, about people, about things that we're doing. Like there's always opportunity to learn and to grow in every season of life we find ourselves, no matter what it looks like. I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying stay in a toxic situation. That's not what I'm saying. All that I am saying is if you find yourself in a situation that you feel like makes no sense, start looking for the gold and you'll see it can I, until you get to the next. Can I, yeah. can I pause you right there? This is why I love you. And I think this is why you and I connect and we kind of get it that there's a lot of people out there. I've heard you say the word process over and over again. Most of my setups came through setbacks and that story of going from human sex trafficking and saving the world to being a receptionist can seem like a downgrade. But if we're, we're, there's so many of us that when given what we don't realize are opportunities in front of us, we're not willing to take a risk and do it either because we think we're better than the moment um, or it's not up to par with who we are or it doesn't match the story that we think is unfolding. And like you've said, it's a process. How many times in my life, the failures, the things that I've taken jobs that didn't work out were actually setting me up for literally where I am today. I was a part of partnerships that on paper looked like a failure. But when I took the job, I trusted the Lord's leading and found myself many days crying in my office by myself trying to think like, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And who would have known a decade later, I've had a podcast where it was the greatest incubator that I ever could have had to learn how an industry works and how to do things. And so I think your story is going to resonate with people that may feel like in the season right now, I don't know why I'm doing this, that there is good in it. And it's, it's more your heart posture while you're doing it, because you can go one of two ways. And this is, I think you and I've talked about this a lot. People that make it, like we say, or they kind of grow into the person they are is mostly because they had the right heart position. They didn't understand everything, but they at least did it with all their heart. And then there's people that when given opportunities, bicker, complain, um, they don't want to do it, the mindset going into it, you're missing 
that many of the things in my life have been divine appointments, divine mistakes, things that I have literally questioned, why am I here and why am I going through this? Many times it's because there was a lesson that I was to learn that really wasn't for me, but it was to help me resonate with other people like you, our listener. But your story is so real and tangible because even a dating failure or a job that didn't happen on paper, it's like, well, that didn't work the way I thought. But what you learned in that process that was setting you up for where you are today, I think is what we don't talk about in society because when a job doesn't work out, when something doesn't go right, we're ashamed because of our identity. And that's what you're talking about. Our identity is so wrapped up in what we are and the things we do, but there's so much more to life than that. And so I think this kind of conversation of getting you to where we are today to the listener, don't be afraid to look deeper at what's happening in your life right now, that it may not be a mistake. But if you're you know, a person of faith, obviously ask the Lord, what am I missing that I'm not seeing? And even if you're not, just spend some time journaling, get a cup of coffee and think about all the things that are happening to you that maybe you may be missing. It could be you're at your job because there's a person that needs you right now in this season of life and you're going to be a blessing to them. Maybe there's a skill set, like you said, that you were learning on the fly that has now got you to where you are. But don't be afraid just because all the chips aren't lined up and everything isn't perfect to take a risk, to take a chance, to bet on yourself. And the fact that you were willing to tell those two people, I'm so much more than this. I love that because you were at least though willing to back it up. You didn't say, you know, I'm so much more than this, so I'm not taking this job. You said, I'm so much more than this. I'm going to do this for you. And who knew that you were going to have all these opportunities to set you up? So God, I love this story. This is empowering today. Keep keep kind of going along with this process and where we are now. Sure. And it really is a process. You know, I just, I want to touch on something you said, Steve, that very often it has been my experience and I know yours as well. Opportunities mm-hmm. don't come packaged in a way we would expect. Nope. The opportunity that I had to be part of the economic renaissance of an entire region came from moving to a place that I didn't want to go to. Mm. You know, the opportunity that I had to gain the tools that would propel me in the design aspect of my career came from a job I didn't want to take. You know, launching into entrepreneurship came from losing my childhood dream of ballet. Like there's so many things in my life that have actually been gifts that have not come in a way that I would expect. And like, even as much as my dream was to be a professional ballet dancer, there is so much more to me than that. And I know now how miserable I would have been if that was all that my life was. And so I'm just, I'm so grateful for all the opportunities that don't come packaged all the time, the way that we expect. So if there is something that you're like, uh, I don't know about that. Really think twice before you say no. Can I also tell you though, that our friendship has thrived because you need people in your corner that are able to hear what you're going through and championing you. Um, it's very easy sometimes to have friends and family that you share of these experiences, And they're like, you're meant for more than that, that people mean well, They honestly mean well when we tell them things we're doing or working on and they want the best for us. But real friends, and you and I have had so many of these conversations. Rachel, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and you have never questioned me. You you're more of thinking from a lens of like, Steve, well, what if what if the Lord's trying to show you this or that? And you need people in your corner that that care so much about you that they're willing to listen to what you're going through and be willing to help you see what maybe you're missing because those are the people that are going to really help you take the next step in life. And for, um, you know, somebody that you've made an impact on my life, I want to thank you for always being a person like that for me. And hopefully it's been reciprocal, but why don't you keep then? I know you had some big, the one big thing that you wanted to share. And I think we're kind of leading up to that. So I'm just going to give you the space to keep rocking and rolling. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. It's truly, it's those words truly honor me. And I really, I really take those to heart because I think that one of the greatest things we can do for each other 
is call out the greatness that we see in each other. I agree. And I think that that is something that I've definitely needed people to do for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because we go through life and we have experiences that knock us down and things that people say to us that knock us down and we feel out of our comfort zone and what am I doing? And I'm figuring this all out on the fly. And uh, I know there's more inside of me. Why am I not seeing it? We need people around us who will call that out in us, who will remind us who we are, mm-hmm. not who we, what we do, but who we are. I love that. And yeah. And Steve, you are definitely one of those people for me. So thank you. Hey, thank you. So there I was in this situation working for the mafia. And uh, I had a friend who knew how miserable I was there. And she worked in admissions at a local college and they were hiring a marketing director. <laughs> And she begged me to come interview. And honestly, I wanted nothing to do with it. Speaking of opportunities that come packaged, not like we expect. And that was because I had this idea in mind that marketing was, you know, numbers and data and research and all that stuff that just really does not light my fire. And she would not stop asking. So I finally went to the interview just to get her to stop asking and uh, got hired on the spot. And walked right into what was at the time the dream job that I never knew that I wanted, where this very diverse background that I've shared with you, everything from public relations to media to advertising to design to events, like all came together in this incredible package. Not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect package, but incredible package with a cherry on top that was this amazing team of interns that I'm still friends with to this day. And so I became the marketing director of a college. And so I did that for a number of years. And then in 2016, God started telling me that it was time to step out on my own. But I had written a script for what that would look like. And the script that I wrote was that I would step out on my own when I was, you know, happily married home raising babies. And this was going to give me a creative outlet and an entrepreneurial outlet, but I could still focus on my family. Well, in 2016, there was none of that on my radar whatsoever. And, uh, and so I didn't really take it seriously when I felt that it was time to launch. And so in May of that year, right after graduation in the midst of, Hey, can we please get all the graduation photos up by 2 PM? The board voted and decided to eliminate the marketing department. And so in one afternoon I had no job, no computer, no team. And I just knew it was time to launch. And I was scared out of my mind. And I said, yes. And that was seven years ago. So that kind of leads into the next part of my story where I want to talk about my one big thing. So I've told you my story and it's a very non-traditional story. And everything about my life has always been different. And even when I launched into the world of full-time entrepreneurship, that was different. There were no other single women in my circle, starting businesses, launching businesses. The only other women entrepreneurs that I knew all had husbands that were, you know, helping support their ventures and all that kind of stuff. And it was just me on my own. And to be honest, I was terrified. And so fast forward a couple of years and the morning of my 38th birthday, I awoke to the voice of shame, almost audibly screaming in my room, another year older. And what do you have? What do you even have to show for your life? Which is a pretty crappy way to start a birthday, right? (laughs) And in that moment, I think a lot of things that I had been feeling beneath the surface came to the surface. Yeah. And that afternoon, I had a conversation with my friend and mentor, Dan Morey, give him a shout out, that I will never forget. He came in for just a, you know, typical like, hey, how are things going with business? Let's talk about this. And I looked at him and I said, Dan, do you ever question the impact that your life is really making? And he shut his laptop. He said, Rachel, where is that question coming from? And I asked it again. And he said, Rachel, I know you. And I know that whatever you are measuring yourself against right now, isn't probably what even really matters most to you. And I think you need to go home and get out your journal. And I think you need to have a conversation with God about that. (laughs) And I did. And that conversation that day 
he actually showed me this incredible video, by the way, called God's Masterpiece, um, that I was just in tears in my office. And he was like, okay, go home, go get your journal. (laughs) And I did. And here is the thing. I had all of these people in my community, you know, you being one of them, Steve, saying, Rachel, you're so inspiring. You're so inspiring. I just want to just want to get coffee with you. I just want to hear your story. And what nobody knew was that I went home and I looked in the mirror and I felt like the girl who didn't make the cut for the lead in my own story. Hmm. Because the same thing that made me inspiring to everybody else was what was making me shameful to myself. And that was being different. And so I journaled that day and I proceeded to journal for months And what God did was he took me on this journey of going back to these seasons of my life where honestly, that concept of being different, right? Like Steve, you know me, everything about me is different. I have never fit in in any crowd in my life and I probably never will, whether it's my height or the things I'm interested in or any of that. Like I just, I am different and I see that now. But earlier in my life, like there was rejection associated with that. There was pain associated with that, right? Like growing up, what we want is we want to fit in on the playground and be like everybody else. And whether it was being the pastor's daughter or the ballerina who walked funny or the nerd who loved school, like I just didn't fit the mold of anybody else. Yeah. And so here I was at 38 years old, feeling like a failure because of that. And what God did in that season is took me back to those parts of my life and we mined out the gold together. And I saw how what had been kind of like a scarlet letter, it felt like, of being different was actually a gift. And as I went through these seasons, I began to see how being different provided me opportunities that other people didn't have, how it allowed me to connect and have experiences and meet people and just all of these things. Like even the story that I just told you, my career trajectory is totally different than most people that I know. And so as I went on this journey, I came to see that this word different that had been such a stigma to me was actually a gift It was actually a gift. And if I can just throw a scripture in because it's impressed on my heart. You know, there's a scripture that as people of faith, we like to quote a lot, which is, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know if you look up that word, it doesn't actually say wonderfully. That word is actually different. I am awfully like awe, full of awe in how differently I have been made. And that is something that I have come to see is how being different is such a gift because I was never made to fit in. I was born to stand out. Literally what I do, even with branding, who I am, the brand boss isn't my identity. It's who it's part of what I do. Right. But I, Rachel, who was uniquely made different on purpose for a purpose. Every facet of my difference is made differently because there is something unique that I bring to the world in a way that no one else can, whether that's in business or friendship or any other area of life. There is something unique about you that is different. You were made differently on purpose for a purpose. And I think sometimes we see these things about ourselves and we're like, well, I'm just different. Or we might embrace our difference. And something that I came to in my own journey is the power of owning my difference. It's one thing just to say, oh, well, I'm just different. I'm just not like everybody else. It's another thing to own that and say, I own my difference. Every facet of me that is different is a unique facet that I get to display to this world. I get to bring this gift 
of the difference that I am. And I own that. And I am done letting other people define who I am. I am done letting what I do define who I am. I am done letting other people put a label on me. I am done letting all the shoulda, woulda, couldas where I thought I should be at this point in my life define who I am. It is time for me to be who I am and let the fullness of who I am and the difference of who I am be on display because that is a gift that I bring to the world that nobody else can. Whether it's the way that I serve people in in business, whether it's the way that I serve people in business or the way that I'm a friend, there is something different about each one of us that each one of us brings to the conversation, to the table, to life, to the world in a way that nobody else can. And the moment that we stop trying to fit in and be like everybody else and measure ourselves, you know, it's only when we feel like we have something to measure against that we feel like we don't measure up. True. It's only when we take that measuring line off and we show up in the fullness and the authenticity of who we are. Yep. Hey, this is who I am that we fully give the world the gift of who we are when we let our difference be on display. I think if the one big thing podcast studio ever caught on fire, it was a few minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) There's so much in that, that you can unpack because there are the disappointments in the life that we experience words spoken over us. But then there's also things that have happened to you as a listener that you didn't choose. There are, there are grown adults that were abandoned as kids by parents that on the surface seemed like they didn't want them. There are people that had parents that neglected them. There are people that wish their family was different, um, that they came from a better upbringing. And you're allowing those things to limit what God can do in your life today. And this is not a Christian podcast, but it's our hearts. Um, There are people today that are, you know, um, I was having a conversation with a buddy today that many times pain in our body, in our low back, whatever it is, actually stems from another part of our body. We just don't diagnose it. And I think it's true in our life. There are things that we experience today that are pain points that actually stem from another part of our life that we just don't know. And your story is so inspiring because there are people that are dealing with really hard things. God, why am I single? God, why don't I have kids? God, why is it a struggle? God, why can't I land my job? Why am I different? In what you just shared about owning your difference, you are now probably only able to be a brand boss. Rachel, to bring a little lightness, I think the only place you actually fit in is in my son's Joshua shoes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So, so Rachel, Rachel called me several months ago and said, Hey, I have to stop in Knoxville for a day or two. Can I stay with you? And Steph wasn't hesitation. It's yeah, come on by. She stayed with us for a day and a half. I'm at the office working and she sends a picture. Now that I know the ballerina was part of your upbringing that you and my son, Joshua, who's seven years old, had the same exact pair of new balances on in the same size. And it was ironic because even though in life, your stature as a ballerina maybe what it is, you are a giant in terms of your impact. And I think that in and of itself, you do not have to be limited by what you do. You are designed on purpose for a purpose. Now you can use the tools and the things in front of you and the platforms like I do to reach and help inspire other people, but don't view your disappointments and disruptions as just random things. There is pain in the purpose of all of these things. And what I love about what you're able to do, again, not knowing where we were going in this conversation today, I'm just so amped up because there are going to be people as listeners that listen to your story and they feel connected. They may not even feel connected to their, to their colleagues or family members that have never gone through what they are, but for a moment in life, Rachel Jenks will be a voice in a seeless, endless, hopeless situation that makes them say, thank you, that someone recognizes life hasn't gone the way it was scripted to go. I was supposed to be at a certain place with certain things set up in my life. And yet, and you and I have talked about this, where you are today is exactly where you're supposed to be. And that that shaping people's identity, that process that we're all on, when you discover what you've discovered, you have the opportunity to 
turn the world upside down. So what you said earlier, I'm going to speak a little life over you. You may not be able to end sex trafficking, but what you have learned in this process, you will single-handedly change people's lives from this podcast episode. So it's a job well done. You've, you've taken all of the things that have been thrown at you, some chosen, some not, and you've learned how not to let those be limiting, understanding that there's not moments when you wake up and the world is screaming at you, you know, you should be doing more. Those are very real things that we all as human beings have to deal with, but those moments can never define who we are in process of becoming. And I say this all the time, life is not about perfection. It's about progress. It has been an honor being your friend and seeing your growth and maturation because you have not allowed the circumstances in your life to be limiting to you. And you are not only helping your personal clients as a brand boss, which I'm going to ask all of you to go out there and support the brand boss podcast. You are a champion, but just in who you are as a person is so inspiring that you are going to reach people that maybe my wife did in an episode one. And with each next guest, their stories will resonate with you. And as if it impacts you as a person, then we've done what we've supposed to do. Um, I want to kind of ask you though, in this, is there anything else in this one big thing that you want to share? Because I know that we also like to bring every episode home with a very practical exercise of start, stop and continue. But before we do that, is there anything else that, that you just have on your heart that you feel like you should share? Yeah. I just really want to encourage you to take a moment after you listen to the show and ask yourself, who am I? Boom. And really think about that. Yeah. Beyond what you do, beyond even your role as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, as a sibling, as a whatever, take a moment and ask yourself, who am I? And then as you kind of look through some of those adjectives, ask yourself where they came from and if they feel in alignment with you or not, or have you accepted an identity that circumstance put on you or that somebody else put on you? Yeah. Because every moment we get to choose to come out of alignment with that. Hmm. And so if you see things in your own definition of yourself that you're like, doesn't actually, something about that doesn't feel right to me, then dig into that. Ask yourself where that came from. Unpack that lie. And then you have the power to come out of agreement with that, to break agreement with that and to align with the truth. Because when we align with the truth of who we are, that's when we can walk as who we are in freedom. Gosh, I mean, come on now. I mean, this the stuff in this episode alone is awe-inspiring. And I, I want to honor somebody before we even jump into uh, Start, Stop, Continue. Um, we didn't know coming out of episode one, does anybody care to listen to my heart for encouraging and putting other people and honoring them? Uh, we had a good friend, Bren, um, who took a risk herself and she launched her own magazine called One True Hope. She had messaged us after the first episode and said just how much it meant to her that she wanted to feature my wife and I's episode in her digital magazine that was just launched. And so I just want to give her a little bit of honor by saying, if you are somebody that this kind of podcast resonates with you, stories of overcoming, stories of inspiration, then One True Hope magazine, um, which you can find, uh, let me give you one true hope dot life. I'd love everybody listening to the show. Just go stop by one true hope dot life. Take a look. If you feel so inclined to support her by subscribing to her magazine, um, I know it would bless her, but I wanted to give a shout out to her for putting my wife and I in another platform that could reach more people. So Bren, we appreciate you. We love you. Um, but let's bring this episode to a close with the brand boss and an even greater friend by talking about the real practical insights of start, stop, continue. So go right ahead. Yeah. So something that I want to start and stop doing kind of go hand in hand. And for people who do care about the impact that we make in the world and who do have a huge heart to encourage and help others, one of the things that we can find ourselves doing sometimes is saying yes too much hmm. and overextending ourselves. And so I want to start putting better boundaries in place 
And I think that a good way for me to do that is before I make a decision, when somebody asks me to do something or, you know, sends me a message that I know it's going to take me a little bit to respond to them because they really need somebody to be there for them, to take a moment and check in with myself first and take a deep breath and say, okay, if I say yes to this, does it mean letting go of something that I was choosing to do to move things forward in my life, right? So whether like a great example of this is I had a friend who just really needed somebody to listen, which was great, but I had committed to myself that I really wanted to get outside that day and I wanted to go for a walk at the park. And what I could have done is I could have called her and walked at the park. But instead what I did is we were going back and forth on voice messages and whatever, and I never got to the park that day. And I ended up feeling kind of sad, even though I was happy to be there for my friends. So I think the start is the start and stop kind of go hand in hand. Stop just saying yes. Stop just automatically saying, yes, I can. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll be there. And start taking a moment to take a deep breath and check in with myself. What do I need in this moment? And remember that that's not selfish. What do I need in this moment? What was on my plate for today? What are the things that are moving me forward? If I say yes to this, will it mean letting go of that? And if it does, right? And if it does, then do I need to say no? Or do I need to say, hey, I can do it in this time frame. But making sure that I start checking in with myself, what do I need? And what do I need to move things forward in my own life? And if I say yes to this, will it impact that? And knowing that I have permission to say no. I love that. Did you have a, did you have a continue that you wanted to share? Yeah, I do. I think continue kind of goes in line with that. One of the things that I'm learning to do, and so this is also continuing, is to check in with myself more regularly. Sometimes we just get busy. We just get going through things. We just get going through life. We just get doing things, whatever. And like actually taking a moment to stop and say, well, how do I actually feel right now? Hmm. Sometimes it's like, I'm having a blast great. Let me just sit in the joy of that for a moment. I'm feeling kind of frustrated right now. Okay. What's going on? You know, so many times we just like go through life and we gloss over how am I actually doing? And so one of the things that I want to continue doing is being intentional to check in with myself on a regular basis, even throughout the day. How am I doing in this moment? What do I need? Is this an emotion I just want to savor? Is this an emotion I need to process? Is this an emotion I need to talk through and not just kind of getting through the day? I love that. And that's so good because I personal antidote, what you just shared. I have a big personality. I love people. I'm an extrovert at my heart and I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, God has given me a unique gift of self-encouragement. I can think about things that I'm dealing with and kind of talk myself into a better way of feeling most times. I remember several years ago, um, after a church service, a woman came up to me and it wasn't just like, how you doing as a quick conversation. She said, Steve, how are you? And I remember I like glitched and I was like, what? And she was like, how are you? And I, I broke down crying and it was just, I had so many things I was carrying and I was, you know, smiling all the time, but to have somebody else that really asked me, which is, I think what you said, we need to learn to ask ourselves is just, how am I doing? So the start, stop continues. I mean, these are really meant to help inspire you as a listener to take something from each guest. Maybe all three apply, maybe none of them apply. But if a simple thing from Rachel is that learning how to pace your own life and making sure that you are, first of all, taking care of yourself. And we're not talking about the worldly self-care, self-love that can get taken to an extreme. We're just talking about God has given you a hardwired DNA that you need to learn how you operate. And if that means kind of correcting yourself first so that you can pour out to loved ones, kids, whoever, what they need from you, that's such a huge permission to give people to know that it's not your job to carry every else, everybody else's burdens and to be a hero. And I say all the time, I can't give the world Superman and my family gets Clark Kent. That's not fair. And so just learning, you can't save everybody, but just how do you make the most of today? How do you know that today could be the greatest day of your life and that disruption could actually be a setup for an opportunity to come? 
I think, Rachel, I couldn't have asked for a better guest as episode two of The One Big Thing. I want you guys to go out, though, and celebrate my friend. I will put in the show notes of this show, Rachel's social media handles. Um, she's got some exciting, cool stuff that I know for the sake of time we weren't really able to get into. But I do want to at least give you a little bit of a minute if you want to plug it here, kind of this new venture uh, in case somebody wants to check it out. Sure, sure. So I'll hit two things real quick. So if what you have heard today has resonated with you and you find yourself saying, you know what, who am I? Or realizing that how you have shown up in the world has been different than who you are. Would you please send me a DM? I'd love to have that conversation with you. That's great. Um, I also, you know, I do personal branding coaching. And so if that's something that I can help you with, I'd be honored to. In addition, I, I just also love helping people tap into the greatness of who they are. And then the second thing is a passion project. So Steve mentioned dating disasters. Um, and so a friend of mine and I recently launched a podcast called Dazed and Confused in the Dating Pool because I am in my 40s and I am dating. And for me, I was raised in a culture that taught me how to wait, but not how to date. And when I stepped back into the dating pool, it was a very disorienting place and, you know, again, there is gold in all of our journeys. And there's really been a lot of gold that I've mined out of this that I've come to see. You know, it's been not the easiest journey for sure, but I've been learning so much about myself, about relationships, about others. And so, and my friend has too. And so, you know, we just kind of were going back and forth sharing our journeys. And then one night he was like, hey, you want to start a podcast? I was like, yeah, let's start a podcast. So, um, so again, we are not dating experts. We don't pretend to be, we are just two friends who happen to love Jesus, who are navigating the world of dating, which really comes down to meeting other people and how can we handle that with honor? And that's really what our podcast is about. What does it look like to honor God, to honor the people that we're meeting in dating? So that is Dazed and Confused in the pot, in the Dating Pool podcast. You can find that on YouTube. I love that. And I think that just speaks to what you just shared. If you don't have people going through what you're experiencing, the world can feel awfully lonely and isolated. And so you might be on the show and you're single and you are just identifying what Rachel said. Please check out that, that resource. Uh, it's just one more way that you can get a community built. And that's the whole point of this show. So Rachel, I just want to thank you uh, for being guest number two on the One Big Thing podcast. Get out there, champion her, listen to her. She obviously is a voice of inspiration that is a dear friend I love. Uh, but would love to get in contact with you. So I appreciate you stopping by today's episode.